Welcome everyone to this webinar. Thank you so much for joining today um, for these finance um, innovations in value chains webinar, uh, where we are going to understand a bit on the challenges and potentials. Uh, this webinar is hosted by the Knowledge Platform for Inclusive and Sustainable Food Markets and Value Chains, KISM, uh, which is part of the CGR initiative on rethinking food markets and it's been implemented in partnership with ISIL and Evidencia. I'm Rita Mendez, and I'm an Associate Manager at ISIL, and I'm part of the KISM implementation team. Before um, we talk a bit more about today's webinar, I would like to share with you some session guidelines. Uh, the session is being recorded, and we will share with you the recording and the slides um, within a couple of weeks. We will also upload it to the KISM uh, website. Uh, the panelists are going to uh, present um, their views on the topic and we'll then have uh, an open section for a Q&A with the audience. So we welcome all of you to submit your questions or comments into the chat. You can also do it verbally, raising your hand and we'll give you the word um, for that. Before we get into the webinar, I just wanted to briefly introduce KISM. As I said, this webinar is hosted within the KISM program. Um, the KISM is a research and knowledge uh, gateway to help uh, farmers, uh, food businesses, governments, practitioners to, be to make better informed decisions um, on um, investment, policy decisions on inclusive and sustainable food value chains. Um, KISM, the platform is situated within the CDR Rethinking Food Markets initiative and uh, is designed to share cutting edge research emerging from the CDR initiative um, and convene stakeholders to make sense of the research and improve policy coherence and market reform. So discuss about the insights that the initiative um, is extracting through their work. Uh, KISM is not just a way to get in into the knowledge that is being published by an initiative, but it's also a gateway to access uh, credible research and data in this field that is being published by other knowledge platforms such as Evidencia or the Value Change Knowledge uh, Portal. KISM includes many features. Um, is partly a research library um, where you can find all resources on the site. is also a knowledge platform for policy dialogue and exchange of ideas on rethinking food markets and value chains. So we organize events on the topics that uh, the research initiative is focusing on. We also have discussion forums on the topic and we also have knowledge tools to be able to visualize the research and understand better. Therefore, in KISM, you can find a compilation of information and insights published by the initiative um, and uh, engage with others. As I was saying, KISM um, includes all the research emerging from the Rethinking Food Markets Initiative. And um, that work look at three main areas, global integrated value chains uh, that include innovations that look at for example, vertical integration, food standards, and inclusive uh, contractive, contracting. Um, we're package two of the initiative, look at domestic food value chains, um, and they explore uh, innovations such as value chain infrastructure, product upgrading, or inclusive business models. And uh, the other area of work of the initiative is focused on cross-market services, looking at logistic innovations, digital finance um, for inclusive value chains. Today's webinar is sitting within work package three of the initiative, so, and is led by Kate Ambler, and um, focuses on digital finance for inclusive value chain. You can easily find all knowledge products that are published by the CGR Rethinking Food Market Initiative by work package in the library. So as you can see in the screen, you can access the library and you can select uh, knowledge source and choose the type of innovations that you are 
interested in and you will see the products that um, CGR uh, is publishing with regards to, to that. Um, now moving into the agenda. The webinar today, as I was saying, we'll explore financing uh, in, in the value chain and we will hear from three um, research fellows of um, the Market Trade and Institution Unit at IFPRI that will present uh, some case studies, uh, country specific. So first of all, on Vietnam and, Inno and Indonesia. Secondly, on Bangladesh, uh, Nigeria, and Uganda. And finally, on Uganda and Bangladesh, focusing on different financial needs and financial uh, innovations. Um, I'm also pleased to introduce uh, Merab uh, Bakhtiar, Research Fellow at the Poverty, Gender, and Inclusion uh, Unit um, at IFPRI, who is going to moderate and do some welcome remarks for all of us. Uh, for this webinar. So welcome, Marab, and I pass over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Rita. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. A, so as we gather today to delve into the realm of financing innovations in agricultural value chains, it is essential to recognize that um, the transformative power of, of agriculture in shaping economies particularly the economies that IFPRI researchers work very closely on, like many of the developing countries in the world, in, in, in Asia, Africa, the Latin America. Um, but uh, so an important part is that overall agricultural backbone, agriculture is not just about farming. It is a complex web of activities that connects farmers to consumers. This web is known as the agricultural value chain, and it plays a pivotal role in driving economic growth, ensuring food security, and providing employment to millions. Uh, there is a hidden middle. So while the spotlight often shines on producers and consumers, the intermediary firms or actors uh, or the hidden, hidden middle, as they have been recently dubbed, are the unsung heroes of this chain. They bridge the gap, ensuring the products move seamlessly from, farmer, from farms to tables. Yet their financial needs challenges and potential are often overlooked. Access to finance remains a significant hurdle for many actors within the agricultural value chain, especially small farmers. Traditional financial systems often fall short in catering to their unique needs, leading to a gap that hinders growth and innovation. However, the landscape is changing from digital platforms in Uganda, connecting farmers to resources to profit sharing models in Bangladesh, innovative financial solutions are emerging. These solutions aim to bridge the financial gap, ensuring that every actor in the value chain can thrive. Today, we will be exploring some of these innovations, challenges, and the potential of financing in agricultural value chains. Let's hear from Alan, Kate, and Jeff on their very interesting research on financing innovations in value chains. Thank you, and let's get started. Thanks, Nairab. Um, I'm going to just switch to my slides really quickly. Um, thanks. I'm going to be talking about uh, in inclusive agricultural value chain finance and evidence from a uh, project that we've had uh, funded through ACIAR, the Australian Center for Agri International Agricultural Research, and uh, through the Policies, Institutions, and Markets uh, uh, CGIR research program, which ended in December of 2021. I uh, want to thank you all for being here. So uh, Mayrub started with uh, part of the project motivation. Um, really what we see everywhere throughout the world is a, is a project, is a, a finance gap uh, between what farmers and particularly smallholder farmers need and what, fa what finance they have access to. Uh, and there's a notion that there are a number of changes, trends that are transforming agricultural value chains throughout the world, maybe nowhere more so than in Southeast Asia. And these trends include urbanization. We've seen rapid urbanization throughout the world, um, and, and particularly in Southeast Asia, as well as uh, prior to COVID when we uh, conceived of this research pr program, r rising incomes. Although, you know, after a bump, the, the incomes of, of people are rising once again in, in these regions. Um, and third, we've seen rapid technological change. 
Um, that said, even in Southeast Asia, uh, where we see all of these trends kind of coalescing in particular, uh, only 52% of Indonesian adults, uh, for example, have access to formal, the formal financial sector, and even worse uh, percentages exist among rural residents and women. Um, despite the fact that there are services in, in the urban areas that you can't even um, access without, for instance, digital, digital money. Um, so what is agricultural value chain finance, which is what we're studying in this project? It's really when we, we set up what we might call a triangular relationship between farmers, uh, off-takers or processors, and financial institutions. Um, and th the idea is that farmers sell their their products to off-takers who might not want to finance the, 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 well, they might want to, but they might not want to finance the, the activities of farmers. Um, what the off-takers can do is, is help fi uh, financial institutions with a guarantee because they know those farmers. One of the problems that financial institutions have is that they don't know, uh, they don't know farmers, they don't know farming, and as a result, they, they have a hard time um, making loans to farmers. So the loans can then flow from financial institutions to farmers based on the guarantee that these farmers have a market for those products and those off takers or processors uh, are monitoring those loans. Um, so this slide kind of tells us what happens, um, where, where we can get to uh, finance. Farmers have access to, the one bit I maybe missed is that farmers have access to adequate capital to produce more or higher quality. Um, and, a notion again is that ICT through through technology we can lower transaction costs of giving these loans. Now, okay, so we've been trying to solve these problems you... with uh, agricultural value chain. The, this this these problems in Indonesia and in Vietnam and uh, with a two phase project. Um, uh, one of the uh, phases. Merab here, sorry. Um, can you make your slides full screen and also? Uh, I think I did, didn't I? Seem to only see the first first screen and the title screen really you're I'm still sure stuck you're... on the first screen yeah first okay well uh that's interesting because i thought i was sharing oh no. yeah it almost came though uh, okay i'm gonna try one more time here sure. uh the problem is is that zoom covers the all right here okay um uh, uh, Alan, do you see the a, the screen with the notes? So they're the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Uh, I don't know how to. Uh, I can share the slides for you if you want. Uh, maybe it's this one. Is that better? Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Sorry about that. Um, I'll go back one slide then to try to. Okay, so that's, this is where I meant to be, is on the overall project outline. Uh, the project has two phases in three countries. Um, one, those countries are Indonesia, Myanmar, and Vietnam. Um, in phase one, we develop country reports in each country to understand the policies that shape the potential for agricultural value chain finance. And in Indonesia and Vietnam, um, what we found is that the presence of government lending schemes complicates but in different ways. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have, uh, maybe I'll get into that in T, the Q&A. Um, in phase two, which has really only occurred in Vietnam and Indonesia due to the multiple crises that occurred in, in Myanmar, including the complete collapse of its financial system, um, we've been working on pilot projects to test AVCF models. Um, and so what we're planning to do in the next few months as the project wraps up is to use those results to generate evidence-guided policy mes messages tailored to the countries. It's worth mentioning that, we'll, that part of the teams in both countries um, are local uh, researchers very well linked to the governments who are working with IPSARD in Vin Vietnam and ICESEPS in Indonesia. Um, so in Indonesia, we've, with ICESEPS, we've co conducted three small pilot projects to distribute loans through cooperatives uh, slash private sector linkages. Um, we, First start, we first worked with PT Mitra Desa Pamarichan, um, or PT MDP, which is part of a large conglomerate of rice millers. Um, and we, we made loans in that case to rice farmers. Um, the, that one 
had uh, had some issues. So then we, we moved on to do a second pilot with a shallot producer. Uh, Indonesia is the largest shallot producing country in the world. Um, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce it, but UDOP uh, produces shallot for seed. And then they they the farmers need credit to pay in advance for input purchases. And then we worked with um, a, a, a farmer group that does vegetable uh, production for, um, for Malang and for Surabaya. Um, the, the, those markets, uh, this group of vegetable farmers also need a credit. And here again, um, we were able to get them credit to pay partially for their expenses. Um, we're still analyzing results for the pilot from the pilot, but one of the interesting things to note is that, um, and this may link to the government loans, but we had a lot of trouble uh, getting farmers to repay uh, in a on a timely basis for the loans in uh, point one and point three, although they have now fully repaid in point in uh, in pilot one. That said, we were we actually approached twenty more than twenty cooperatives or groups or companies about doing pilots, um, and a lot of them found different reasons not to participate, whether it be that they self financed or they weren't interested, or they we found some kind of potentially catastrophic risks uh, after having had some detailed discussions with them. Um, and that doesn't even include all of the uh, partner companies of um, PTMDP that we also studied fairly carefully. Uh, so basically the idea is that this is tricky. Um, in Vietnam, we did more of a standard uh, randomized control trial type setup. Uh, we worked with the Lin Viet Post Bank to offer kind of tailored loans to coffee farmers, so tailored to their particular needs. Um, these coffee farmers are linked to the Phuc Sin uh, Coffee Company, and that's their co their product right there on the right, uh, Blue Son La. Um, it's an Arabica coffee, which is unusual in Vietnam. Much of the coffee in, in Vietnam is Robusta. And we conducted a, a there a baseline and randomized loan offers. Um, and similar to in Indonesia, we found low take up. Uh, relatively low take up, roughly 10% of the eligible farmers uh, tried, uh, uh, applied for and got loans. Um, and here, part of the problem may have been that the interest rates jumped just as we wanted to make these offers. Um, however, we'll be studying the reasons for that low take up uh, at the end of the project. So what have we learned about AV AVCF? One is that it's, it's really difficult to actually con struck these schemes, even though they, they really flourished in Eastern Europe and uh, right after the fall of the Soviet Union, and there may have been particular, and there, there are some that are flourishing in Uganda right now as well. Um, it can break down quickly uh, as we look for possible participants. Um, and, you know, one of the things that might be there is that it as well, and this is something we're studying in, in uh, Vietnam in particular, is whether there are, there are other issues that farmers have, um, and maybe they, they see the opportunity costs uh, of their informal uh, finance uh, as being just much lower. Um, it's also not easy to get technology involved, although it might be easier. Um, this is for true for Indonesia with a true bank involved. It might also be harder actually. Um, could piloting core loans, uh, core, that's a, this is a bit for Indonesia. We've, we've thought about piloting the core loans there, uh, which is a government subsidized loan uh, to agriculture and make that a, a solution for improved agricultural value chain finance. Um, some concluding thoughts just to, to, to state is that the global macro environment has really changed since 2019 um, and the pre-COVID stability that we saw really through much of this century um, is probably gone for the, for the medium term. The low interest rate environment uh, which made venture capital and a lot of innovative ideas possible may be, may be gone for a while. Um, and we're likely to continue to see volatility due to conflict uh, and, and climate change. Um, and so future or larger pilot projects that try to link farmers to the fin formal financial system have to be long enough to overcome uh, vol volatility and consider uh, what's happening in the global macroeconomic environment. Um, and thank you very much. I'm over to Jeff now, I believe. Or Kate, my bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Um,
Thanks. Sorry, I'm just trying to do the slideshow. The Zoom stuff is hiding my PowerPoint menu. <laughs> All right. Um, is that okay? Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Correctly? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. We, uh, we were just joking before the webinar that we didn't know how to use Zoom well, and we we're going to have trouble sharing our slides, and it occurred. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Um, and so I am now going to talk about um, uh, the work that we're doing in Work Package 3 of the Rethinking Markets Initiative, um, which is basically taking a little bit of a different angle on finding financial solutions um, through three case studies in Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Uganda. The motivation for the work that we're doing is similar to uh, what motivated the agricultural value chain finance work that Alan was discussing in that small farmers are still in need of accessible credit. Um, and that, you know, credit provided through um, that's subsidized means um, is not thought to be sustainable in the long term, but in many cases, traditional commercial banks are not serving these customers well for a variety of reasons. Um, they the, it's just it's seen as too risky to serve these customers or too expensive um, or that's just not in their it's not um, efficient because the loan amounts are too small and it's just not in their main sort of business model and so they're not experts in serving this type of, of population. Uh, so there are across the world modern private sector type institutions that are trying to fill this gap. Um, and we're going to discuss some work we're doing with three of these different institutions today. And all this work is occurring under the Rethinking Food Markets Initiative. Um, and in this research initiative, as I was mentioned briefly at the beginning of the webinar, uh, the main goal is basically just to promote equitable and inclusive sharing of income, looking for more and quality employment opportunities within value chains with a focus on empowering women and youth. In this set of studies in particular, we're looking at how modern financing strategies can contribute to these outcomes. Uh, so, and we're looking in three cases, one in Bangladesh at a profit sharing mechanism for livestock farmers, ways to promote the uptake of digital credit and services in Uganda, and then a study where we're hoping to add a flexible cash component to a digital finance service in Nigeria. I'll first talk about the Bangladesh project. Um, and this project, I should say, is being largely led and pushed by Mayrob, who is with us today as well. Um, so he has all the connections with our partners in Bangladesh. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry. The livestock uh, financing program um, in Bangladesh is run by a uh, our partner company who purchases a, a cow. For the farmer, the farmer then takes care of the cow. The cow is sold four to five months later, um, and the farmer during that period is feeding the cow and trying to fatten it up um, for sale and slaughter. And um, the farmer is responsible for all costs for the cow during that period. The profit is later split between the farmer and the company, um, and the profit is defined as just the difference between the purchase price and the sale price, and the farmer keeps two-thirds of that profit, and the uh, company takes one-third. And during this period, the cow is insured against death, um, so there is, some, um, there is some insurance for the farmer. Um, the, the partner that we're working with on this study is called WeGrow. Um, and this is just an example uh, from their website of, of what they do. They have a number of different projects, but um, livestock farming is one of them. So they are, you know, one of these new, um, new. They're not like a standard bank, but they're they're a, a sort of new modern company that's trying to source capital to bring it to smallholder farmers in new and innovative ways. 
one of the ways that we grow looks for capital is through actually um, sort of like peer to peer investing. So you can actually go on their website and um, invest in certain projects. Um, and they also have other sources of capital as well. Um, the evaluation that we're doing with them will in, is studying farmers without the program um, access and then farmers who are accessing the profit sharing group and then as well as a standard credit group. At the same time that we're evaluating how these different financing mechanisms end up benefiting farmers, we are also looking at a gender angle to this program because women do much of the care of livestock when, when families are raising a cow for slaughter. And so um, what we're doing is in half of our cases, the, the project is the cow is being offered to the man in the household. And in the other half of cases, the cow is being offered to the woman. So the idea being that generally she is doing the work for the cow, but that the man controls the income. So we're going to try and see what happens when we actually um, assign the income from the cow to the woman as well to see if it changes like her role in the household and has a beneficial impact. Uh, so, then moving on, our project in Uganda is looking at digital credit and services uptake. Uh, in Uganda, we have a partnership with a digital platform that connects farmers to inputs, technical information, markets, and finance. Um, so, they're sort of referred to themselves as a one-stop shop so that farmers can use their services for a whole variety of things. Um, this can be accessed by farmers through merchants or agents who are enrolled in the program. So they can actually go visit a local agent um, who can you know, access services for them through uh, the phone that they're trained in, or farmers can access through their own smartphone. Um, and there's a whole, like I said, there's a whole menu of services that farmers should be able to access. Um, and when it comes to actually getting access to credit, the idea is that part the the their record of accessing services and payments through this system allows them to eventually also like qualify um, in better ways to be able to be evaluated and qualify for credit. So programs like these have great potential to improve outcomes for farmers by providing them more services in an efficient way. We're really like hoping that the digital can be can be very um, it can cut down on transaction costs and travel costs and really link farmers to services they might not have had before. However, the scoping work that we did for this project and indeed um, other work that exists on these types of um, these types of institutions found finds low use of such projects. And indeed the use of this platform is low relative to registered users. So they have a huge number of people who are signed up for the platform, but we find that people don't really end up using it very much. And this is pretty common in this type, this type of program. So the goal is to somehow increase that uptake and understand what can we do to actually get people involved in this platform with the idea that perhaps if we can introduce it to them and have them understand it better, that that might bridge some of these barriers to actual uptake. So this program will be looking at a sort of light touch program of sensitizing and training both the, the merchants, uh, agents, and the farmers um, to learn how to access the smartphone app or how to work with the merchants um, in order to access these services. And then the goal of the project will to assess the impact of the training on the use of these digital services. Um, and finally, in Nigeria, we're going to be looking at a similar type of service. However, we're going to have a stronger focus just on, on, on the, the credit services that they, um, that they offer. So in Nigeria, our partner is a similar agrotech startup that was identified as the local partner. Um, and they they have, they can you, you can use a smartphone app, but they also have a USSD-based platform. And this can allow farmers to save money, um, through these agents, they can get paid by buyers through their phone number. Um, they There's a service to receive market price updates. There's also some weather information that they can receive. And there is also this idea that they can build up their financial identity and improve their credit, credit worthiness through these transactions that they make on the platform. And finally, they can buy farm inputs on credit. And I have that bolded because that is what we are looking at in this project, but also really the main 
uh, service that our partner has, you know, indicated is is the one that is really of most interest to farmers and and the one that they see the most activity on. Because in, similar to Uganda, there there is low uptake of many of these other services, and in fact, their greatest buy into those services is because farmers get them um, when they take loans out through the system. Um, so in this. In this case, the partner works with commercial banks to provide input loans, and there are a lot of specific requirements, and then there's caps um, based at an economic needs assessment for the farmer at how much they're able to take out. Um, so the loan program is actually really inflexible, um, and that's often connected to the funding source that the that the people that run the, the program have accessed um, and to their own risk, uh, their own risk appetite, which is very, very low. Farmers report that they need higher amounts and they also request cash for other needs so they can have some flexible income to like hire labor and, and that sort of thing. So our project will evaluate the success of offering small top up loans to about 10% either in inputs or cash to see if that can uh, have a positive impact for farmers and additionally to show our partners what repayment looks like because they're quite nervous about providing cash loans. Um, so the idea with this project is to provide uh, small cash top ups and then measure um, repayment of those loans. Um, and if indeed the repayment is just as good as with the inputs, um, then in the future, our partners will feel more comfortable with um, providing such loans. Um, so just to conclude, these innovative financing developed by the private sector does hold promise for smallholders. Digital tools can lower costs and bringing in these new organizations is key because they can be flexible and agile. However, this research that we're doing is important because there are a lot of um, barriers to creating sustainable businesses. And there are not a lot of examples in many countries of companies that have actually um, surpassed these barriers. This includes the enabling environment, like the high costs, um, farmers being able to use the systems, the need for capital from other sources, and just the infrastructure of agents, um, and cell phones and that sort of thing that is really needed for farmers to make good use of them. So the goal of these studies is to provide this guidance on how to overcome some of these issues. Um, thank you. Um, and now I'll pass on to Jeff for the final presentation. All right, can you see my slides? Yes, yes we can. Yes, great. Um, all right, so so for this last bit here, we're gonna sort of uh, change gears a little bit and in, in sort of reflecting on on these challenges uh, and opportunities, you know, providing um, financial opportunities uh, as discussed by, by Alan and, and Kate. Uh, we're gonna talk now about um, midstream value chain actors and, and sort of their access to financial um, services uh, and, and digital financial services in particular. Um, all right, so so as, as May Rob discussed at the beginning, there's there's really this, this quote, hidden middle um, within uh, agri-food value chains. So farmers on the one hand, producers and consumers and households on, on the other hand, We've been studying uh, these folks for for many years from a lot of different different perspectives, but the activities of of what of the of the firms that move uh, agricultural products and food products from producers to consumers is really understudied. Um, this leads folks uh, to to call uh, the these intermediary segments of value chains the hidden middle, and and some some to sort of point out that. Um, really all of our theories of agricultural development, structural transformation, economic development, really abstract away from these, these sort of intermediary um, agri-food value chain actors. Um, so, so to respond to this, we want to collect data on intermediary uh, uh, agri-food value chain actors, traders, producers, uh, wholesalers, um, who, who act as these sort of intermediary links between producers and consumers. The challenge of this of this data collection effort is that, as as Mirab mentioned, he sort of characterized agri agricultural value chains as as a web. Uh, so these 
these value chains take the form of a network where where all of these actors are 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 linked together through a series of financial transactions, either buying transactions or selling transactions. And this makes it really, really difficult to use traditional you know, random sampling methods. These folks tend to be relatively informal in, in many cases and also highly mobile. Um, and we also have sort of limited knowledge of what the structure of these value chains look like. So it's hard to sort of develop uh, a clean sampling frame and randomly sample within, within, those, within that framework. So we are going to implement what's called a respondent-driven sampling uh, design with draws on methods from sociology. Um, and this allows two things. So it allows respondents to inform the path of interview interview process. So it allows respondents themselves to tell us who, who we should be interviewing uh, next. And I'll, sort of, I'll show an illustration of how this sort of works in the next slide. But it allows us to, as researchers, to calculate uh, sampling weights so that we can correct for some sort of bias that may um, come into our data from this, from this approach. So, uh, although farmers are not the primary target of our of our of our work here, we start by talking with a, with a small handful of farmers and we ask them, "Where do you sell your product?" Um, and I should mention we're we're talking about specific commodities here, so um, in, in in two locations. Um, and I'll get to that in the next slide, but we're talking about uh, arabica coffee and soybeans in in Uganda and, and rice and potatoes in, in Bangladesh. Um, so we ask these farmers, where are you selling this this product? And, and then we we write down the phone number of that of the person where they're selling their their commodity. We go and interview that person. We do this over and over and over again until we reach someone who's who's out of, out of geographic scope of our study um, or just sort of too big to to answer our our survey. All right, so we do this in in two countries, Uganda and Bangladesh. In in Uganda, we uh, we focus on um, coffee. Mbale and, and Kasese and, soybe and soybeans and, and lira. These are these are areas where where these commodities are are heavily produced um, uh, and at least initially processed in these regions. And then in Bangladesh, we we focus on uh, Rangpur and Bogra districts, which are both areas where potatoes um, and rice are are, are produced. Um, and just some sort of sample composition and just the demographic statistics. Um, the, the main point here is that there are many uh, agri-food value chain actors um, in, in these in these areas. So uh, we have uh, over a thousand traders in both Uganda and Bangladesh. Um, in Uganda, a much larger sample in, in coffee. Um, in Bangladesh, we have over, over a thousand traders in rice and in potatoes. Um, so this is this is not a small uh, group of, of of people here. This is a substantial. Um, segment of uh, of or source of employment uh, for for these individuals um, and also just sheer number of, of firms. Um, also interesting to point out in both soybean and potato value chains, specifically within the geographic scope um, that we are are sort of focusing on here, we don't have any processors in our data. So this suggests that processing for these commodities happens much closer to to larger um, uh, urban. Um, Urban hubs um, or in export or in export areas. Um, in in both places, the average intermediate inter intermediary actor is predominantly male, um, over forty years old, um, sort of moderate level of, of, of education achievement, and, and owns a a feature phone, uh, not necessarily a, a, a smartphone. All right, so now I'm going to highlight three facts from that, that arise from our. Our surveys. The first is that value added. So this is just the, the difference between uh, the, the buying price and the selling price for these for these um, actors varies uh, significantly uh, across value chain actors. So here we're showing uh, coffee traders, coffee processors, coffee wholesalers. Uh, value added is is much higher for for these folks uh, for coffee uh, agricultural value chain actors compared to soybean value chain actors. And also uh, within the coffee value chain, processing, as we might expect, sort of has the highest uh, level of, uh, of value. We, we want to look at the, the median here uh, indicated by these, these white lines, which is much higher than for traders and for, for wholesalers. Uh, similarly, uh, in Bangladesh, uh, we see that it value added varies quite a bit across value chain actors. And again, uh, within the rice processing segment, uh, this is where where value added is is heavily concentrated. 
Uh, the second fact that I'm going to mention here is that many intermedi intermediary actors have limited access to uh, financial accounts on one hand, and, and then specifically digital access to these accounts uh, in particular. So uh, in, in Uganda, we see we, we see here that copy traders, about 30% of copy traders, um, use a use an account at a financial institution, uh, and, and over uh, about 80% of, of uh, soybean wholesalers use an account at a financial institution. So this is a 50 percentage point gap between copy traders and soybean wholesalers, uh, which is, is quite large. But also access to financial uh, accounts is not universal among, amongst any of these segments. Um, additionally, when we ask, how are you able to access this account? Can you access this, can you access this account digitally? Um, between 40 and 80 percent of these folks can access this account digitally, uh, which, which suggests sort of scope for uh, improved digital access. In Bangladesh, we see much higher rates of, of, of these intermediary actors being able to, uh, or to using an account at a financial institution. However, much lower share of access to digital finance. So around 20 percent of each of these actors um, are able to access their financial account uh, digitally. And the third fact that I'm going to be sort of just showing here is that transactions overwhelmingly use cash. Um, so here we ask folks to say what percentage of your transactions uh, use cash or mobile money or a, a delayed payment or, or a bank transfer. Uh, and, and, uh, and we broke this down between buying transactions and selling transactions. And in both cases here in Uganda, uh, around 80% of their transactions happen uh, with cash. And this is significant because cash uh, carries quite a few sort of uh, hidden or indirect costs. It's, it's very, uh, it's, it's difficult to sort of secure in a lot of cases. Um, uh, there, there are constraints with liquidity and whatnot, um, which, which sort of leads to uh, costs that perhaps are, are sort of unable, or many folks are unable to sort of directly observe but that are nevertheless uh, present um, in, uh, in the life of these, these, these enterprises. Um, similarly, in Bangladesh, uh, we, see, uh, we see that transactions are over, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly use cash. We see higher amounts of, of cash advances, um, which relates a little bit to how we sort of frame these, these response categories in our, in our survey, but do not hear that uh, delayed payment still is, is predominantly a cash payment as well. So we still see uh, rates of uh, uh, use of cash for transactions roughly around 80% uh, in these cases. Um, the other thing to note here is that, uh, particularly here in, in Bangladesh, we see sort of higher use of bank transfers for selling transactions than for buying transactions. So sort of looping back to um, sort of challenges with you know, increasing uh, take up of, of financial services and perhaps digital financial services, uh, implementing uh, these sorts of innovations through agricultural value chains and sort of saying, you know, implementing these, these innovations upstream and sort of allowing them to sort of trickle through the value, value chain uh, through these transactions might be a way to increase take up not only of intermediary actors, but ultimately um, smallholder farmers at the, the sort of base of the, of the value chain. All right, so these are the three facts value added varies within and across uh, agri-food value chains. Many intermediate actors have limited access to digital financial accounts, um, and enterprise transactions are, are overwhelmingly uh, in cash. Uh, that's all I had. We can go into Q&A now. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think we don't have a lot of time, uh, so I just wanted to, uh, we have some questions, and I think some of the answers are, are already being provided uh, by the speakers. Uh, so, a, Kate, there's a question uh, by Georgina Baker. I think you already responded to it, but I'll just quickly uh, add the question here in case you need to add anything else. So the question was, are there any trade-offs between labor uh, or time needed to care for the cow and the extra income generated for the household versus the income generated from other activities like their usual crops or unpaid labor towards, towards households, especially for women? Yes. Um, well, you could take that one too, Mayrov, if you wanted, <laughs> but um, I think that, like, as I said, one, these households are households that have some experience doing livestock raising already, so it's an activity that they are engaged in, at least intermittently, it's a choice that they already have made, um, and we're just 
um, offering a different uh, form of financing, perhaps making it more accessible for them and more and and more profitable. Um, but it's definitely something that we're going to be measuring and looking at, especially because of the gender angle. And when we offer, you know, we're not so worried, I think, about women doing extra labor because our our background research is is such that they do all the labor already anyway um, for this. So they'll be they would be doing it anyway, and then we're just trying to like provide them better access to the actual um, income. Um, and I can answer Georgina's other question as well. She asked about whether whether information um, in these apps, and I think the the answer is absolutely yes. That's like something that many of these apps, including the one in Nigeria offer and it's not just an app they get farmers can get text messages about the weather um and that's i think included in a lot of these and in our, our farmers anyone who has a loan would also um receive that type of information and i but we're not so we're not studying that explicitly although it would be interesting to to study more about about different types of weather services for farmers mm -hmm. oh that's great um a, I don't have anything else to add there, Kate, so uh, just put out for a thing. Um, but stay tuned for, you know, um, research uh, output coming out of that project, hopefully, you know, uh, in, in next year, some of it this year, possibly, but mostly next year. Um, Alan, a, I think there's a question from, a very interesting question from Nick. Um, a, so I think maybe you could take that. So uh, Nick says, one of the main obstacles to credit for small scale farmers is the cost and difficulty of verifying credit worthiness and enforcing the payment. Do we have any information on whether digital tools uh, actually reduce this cost for lenders or has, it, has this not been properly tested in the literature yet? Uh, I think you are muted, Alan. I thought I had muted and I didn't. I'm having tr computer trouble today. Um, user error. Uh, I think there is some work in the literature now that is showing specific types of costs are lower for lenders um, when specifically, um, I'm thinking of, uh, there are some nice RCTs that show uh, that you can build up credit histories through, uh, through digital, means at this point, and that helps with credit scoring, for instance. Um, I'm not sure there are as many tests of, I think we're making assumptions that it would be cheaper to issue loans through digital credit, but I think it's a pretty safe assumption that um, zapping you know, $100 to somebody is cheaper than having them come in and, and sign papers and what not at a bank at a bank um, outlet. Uh, so you also since we're speaking of this, so you also mentioned um, many of the other models that you're testing, right? So loans through cooperatives, and um, you know the agriculture value and financing models. Yeah. Um, and it's not always the case. And you've mentioned this too. It's not. It's not always easy to include technology. Um, yeah. So that that more is like a country specific problem a good that's a good point like in vietnam what we ended up finding is that really there are two banks that dominate um the rural credit space and it's not easy we've we actually talked to a number of people who are trying i've talked to a number of people who are trying to get technology into the that space into the lending space and the the banks just aren't interested because they're doing business the way that they normally do business. And they're not necessarily, neither of those banks are necessarily profit oriented either because they're both um, state owned banks. Um, and I think we, that as an aside, I think we missed the fact that there are still a ton of state owned banks, both in what we consider now market economies, but also in these transitional economies um, in different countries. Um, in fact, I look for literature on that, and it's hard to find anything written in the last 20 years, but somebody should should have been writing that in the last 20 years, because the the objective functions are quite different for those those uh, institutions than for profit-oriented banks. Okay, thank you. So we have a question um, a, for Jeff, and so this was asked by Pierre Traro, Traro sorry if I'm pronouncing the name wrong, uh, from Manobia. Africa uh, slash APZ. Uh, 
So the question is, in our experience, the main impediments in increasing cricket access and affordability for smallholders lie not with technology, but with commercial banks lack, uh, commercial, commercial banks lack of understanding of the temporality of agricultural lending and political interference bailing out lenders. Um, I think this is a broad question. Uh, so what is KSM doing to address these issues? Or you know, this can be actually for all of you uh, because you're doing a work in different countries. But I think maybe Jeff can go first. Um, it was asked during his presentation and then maybe others can go. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think I think this is, I think our experience or at least the survey work that I was presenting sort of speaks to this too, that um, uh, like technological barriers or like at least like knowledge about how to use these technologies is not like a primary barrier. A lot of times, you know, like for example, uh, in our uh, survey work in, in Uganda, we found that folks use mobile money quite a bit um, in, in, their, in their regular, you know, personal life. But when we ask them about, you know, using mobile money to facilitate their enterprise transactions, they're like, yeah, we rarely do that. That's not really um, something we want to do. And so there's, there's clearly a constraint there that, um, you know, the, you know, this product, this digital product, this financial product, or, you know, in this case, mobile money, but, you know, I think it extrapolates to, to other sort of financial products just like isn't super well designed for uh, these, these enterprises who perhaps are doing, you know, higher frequency of, of, of transactions, um, perhaps, perhaps larger uh, transactions, um, you know, so thinking about crafting new technologies or in, in new financial um, products um, through these banks may be a sort of a primary constraint. Great, thanks, thanks, Jeff. Uh, if you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> let me just add, I'm sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, that's a great point. Um, and I think that um, it's something that we, as we've been talking <clears throat> to these like new types of like um, digital um, agricultural services providers, we've definitely learned so much about like the space um, and like what some of the challenges are. And, and it's certainly true that like the capital access is a huge issue um, and that there's a big, like there's a lot of fear on all sides about the risk of working with smallholders and that sort of thing. So I think that um, like the work we're doing in Nigeria, for example, is important because we're trying to like do some research. It's a very small step, but like that's the type of work we're trying to do to try to show that like doing some of these like innovative credit products with smallholders is not going to, you know, have a negative impact on the bank's balance sheet. Um, the bank, you know, it's like the bank through our um our partner. Um, but yeah, so that's that's just an example where I think we're working on multiple angles, but the angle of like trying to um, pull financing through to these new services um, is is important, as you say. So there's a question on climate change, um, and I'm not sure who to direct this question to. So please uh, feel free to uh, you know uh, share your thoughts. The question is how this process of accessing finance are being adapted to climate change adaptation strategies in local territorial agendas. Hey Rob, I can take that one. I just answered it uh, by oh, typing, but um, just quickly, since we're running short on time, um, we're we're thinking about that in particular because uh, to to shift activities to be more to be greener, farmers likely need finance, and you know the results that we're ha we have in the ABCF survey uh, show that farmers may not um, actually demand that finance. So we need to figure out better ways to to induce Induce isn't quite the right word, but to make that finance attractive to farmers so that they are able to invest in green, greener activities. Uh, there's one question for uh, the profit sharing project. So uh, I, I can actually take that, Kate, if that's okay. So I think the question says, in the cow profit split study, how comparable is the cost of keeping the cow to the purchase um, uh, cost of the cow? Uh, vis-a-vis -vis the profit split. So um, we do find that a, um, you know, this project started and we are actually 
you know, coming across different kinds of challenges. So one challenge for farmers is uh, the feed cost. So feed cost is substantially high, and we do find that, you know, even with uh, a profit sharing type contract, which could be attractive, attractive to smallholders who are very risk averse, um, you know, uh, it, it, it might still be difficult, particularly if farmers just rear one cow because the profit coming in might not be very high after you account for for the feed cost. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have some numbers um, on this one. So I think we are um, a almost uh, you know near the end um, of our um, of our program. So if it's okay, I'll just uh, go ahead and um, add some concluding summarizing thoughts. A so a thank you very much, uh, Kate, Alan, and Jeff for sharing um, a very interesting studies, um, background studies, studies that have are uh, most of them are seem to be in an inception phase. So hopefully a lot of interesting results coming in. Um, um, you know, in the you know, next year uh, and, and afterwards. So we do see several examples of innovative financial solutions. So Alan mentioned um, agriculture value chain financing models in Indonesia, Myanmar, and Vietnam, loans through cooperatives, uh, credit to pay in advance for input purchases, et cetera. Um, the the take-up seems to be quite low, so I'm sure that is something that we struggle quite a bit. It's possible that in many of these localities, um, you know, a, a farmers are not quite familiar, uh, and if there are new entrants, um, you know, a, there's always a, uh, like, trust could be an issue uh, that, that I have faced in some some projects. Um, a difficult to include technology, uh, you know, difficulties including technology, we've discussed this a little bit, a, but also like macro, macroeconomic problems, uh, Alan mentioned about the interest rates uh, hikes, for example, that is also affecting and the take-up rates. Across countries like Bangladesh, Nigeria, and Uganda, we have seen the emergence of innovative financial solutions, uh, such as livestock financing, um, and also companies that, uh, you know, uh, sorry, uh, livestock financing with profit sharing. In Uganda, we have seen examples of digital platforms bridging the gap, connecting farmers to essential resources, including finance. And uh, in Nigeria, we have seen agrotech startups that are leveraging technology to offer flexible financial solutions to farmers. Uh, Jeff uh, detailed um, the hidden middle uh, in agricultural value chains um, and, in, and the fact that in, in, in developing countries, a, you know, while these value chains are going through a transformation, a, and a lot of attention has been given to producers and consumers, intermediary firms uh, or the hidden middle actually play a pivotal role uh, and their need, especially in terms of finance, are often overlooked. So understanding their needs, uh, what they're doing, the value, uh, what the, the kind of value that they're adding to the product. So we have seen a uh, brief mention of that, uh, which I think are very interesting um, and can help form uh, you know, interesting innovations uh, that can be tested out in the future. So um, despite these innovations that we see uh, in, from the different contexts, uh, challenges do persist um, and uh, uh, traditional subsidies can be unsustainable. Conventional banks often don't cater effectively. We saw that from some of the questions that we've received. Um, so overall, I think uh, this was a, a very interesting uh, 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 set of uh, talks. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the questions. Uh, please feel free to reach out to the team um, you have uh, and also the Kissing uh, team, uh, you know, if you, if you want access to the slides, for example. Uh, I'd like to end here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marab. I'm just going to add a minute of uh, of info uh, to close the webinar. Thank you so much for to the speakers and to you to um, for facilitating this uh, session. I think it was very rich in content, and I'm sorry we didn't plan it for 75 minutes uh, because I think we had lots of of very interesting questions. As we said, um, Kizem will host the recording and the content of this, of this webinar. And we will also write a blog to summarize some of the key insights of, of it. Um, you can also find the knowledge products that uh, Kate's team has uh, have produced. And you can also sign up to our mailing list. So you see the QR um, on the screen, I think my, uh, colleagues are also sharing the link in the chat where you can sign in uh, to the, our mini list and receive uh, our upcoming events and resources uh, that will always focus on topics that have been researched by the teams at the 
CGR Rethinking Food Markets Initiative. So with that, uh, just thank you again, and uh, we hope to see you again in the next webinar.